So, class, let's begin. Um, a couple of general things. Um, so, this week we are talking about Creswell chapters 1 and 3. And um, I have heard from a couple of folks uh, with not just this week, but from other weeks and readings, there have been some various difficulties getting books um, or making a, a reading for a specific week, and this happens. And one of the benefits of this course is that you are not tested on the reading, but I do expect you to use the readings and to actually uh, be able to apply this um, in two different ways. One is that we are going to be discussing it every week like we've been doing. Um, so you can call forth anything that is particularly interesting to you or that you have a question about and then we can have some conversation in class about what's coming up from the readings. Um, but, and I want you to be prepared for the class discussion obviously because it's embarrassing when you're not and we all secretly laugh at you when you have nothing to say. Right? No. Um, but I do want you to be prepared so that you can join in. I think that that's very important. And uh, the second, though, is that what you are graded on in this class is your two research projects. So in the first half of the semester, we're doing the, uh, the observation research. In the second half of the semester, we are doing a uh, interview research. And your ability to effectively do your research and all of the stages of that research are going to be greatly improved if you are doing the reading and spending some time thinking about it and processing through uh, rather than just kind of skimming through so that you have something to say in class. You guys good in Bangor? We're here in an awful town. Yeah, it's so hard to hear you. It's hard to hear you. <laughs> it shouldn't be. My laptop isn't connected to anything. Yeah, if you're on mute, do you hear the feedback? Yes. That's real quick. Okay, is the feedback going away or is it still ongoing? Just going to talk a little bit. Still on. It's still ongoing. It's still on. Huh. It's not from our end, it's from your end somewhere. Because oh. hmm. the microphone is it's up. Like, it's like this. It's like this. It's moving chairs or something. It sounds like something, cables maybe touching one another or. Okay. So what I'm telling you right now is our microphone is actually up on the ceiling. It's hanging from the ceiling. Uh, and at least that we are able to determine there is no background noise except perhaps uh, the air conditioning, which is uh, in uh, inter, what is it called? The um, central. yeah, central air. So we, it's not like a window unit. Do you guys here in Augusta have any other idea what it, this might possibly be? Sound. I hate sound. Um, crap. So. Hello, come on in. We're commiserating about background noise. Yeah, there's there's a sound that's possibly coming in from another room. Um, is there construction happening on campus somewhere? Like there's a little hum. That's what we're hearing. A hum. Yeah. But it's really picking up in the, the microphone. But I hear from the TV. Like, it just. Huh. It's just a little hum. Can we turn one of the TVs off? Like that one, we don't need to see us. You're over here. We can't touch them. They're linked again. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me. Okay. Uh, Ryan just went and checked out uh, in the hallway, and there's not a sound coming from external, so it must be just like a, the AC or something in this room. I don't know why it's coming through worse right now. 
Um, so let me ask a couple of questions. If I speak loud and slowly, can you hear me sufficiently to continue with class? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Uh, that is what I will attempt to do. I will also ask that everybody uh, who is not actively talking um, each site, and we'll do this as well, to mute your side, and then uh, maybe that will help cut down on some of the interference that we're getting. Um, I'm going to go back to my previous point because this is very important and I want you all to hear it. Uh, when you are having trouble getting to the reading before class, uh, that means that you're going to have difficulty, you know, contributing to class discussion and understanding at least fully what it is that we're talking about because you don't have the full contextual background information that everyone else is operating from. Uh, and indeed that I am operating from. I'm assuming that you have all read the works. Um, but in addition, when you're doing your research, there are two things that I am going to be grading you on. And that is number one, actually being able to conduct a high quality qualitative research uh, project. And that means using the information from the textbooks in order to inform your process and all of the steps that you take. And so if you are skipping over the readings and missing those entirely, then you don't have all of that information informing what the process should be. And number two, you're going to be reporting on your research. So you'll take the steps, but then you'll tell me about all of the steps that you took in your final report for both projects. You'll talk about your methods, you'll talk about your uh, research problem, you'll talk about your data collection, you'll talk about your analysis, and I want you to be able to use the terminology and the concepts from the readings. And so, all of this is to say, if you are not able to get to a reading before class one day, well, that sucks, that's too bad, but go back and do the readings later on. Don't just skip it because we're no longer going to talk about that in class. You still need the readings in order to uh, move forward effectively in this class for the aspects of class that you will be graded on. So even though we are not testing on the readings themselves, I do want you to be prepared to do good research, and that means spending some time outside of class and outside of our discussion thinking about and learning about how to do good qualitative research. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Good. Today, we are going to have three pieces of our uh, class. First, we are going to go around, even with the audio feedback, and we are going to say our names, and uh, we are going to say your favorite childhood toy or imaginary friend, and that's what we're going to share with each other today. I'm getting some weird faces. Excellent. So, uh, my name is Katie. My imaginary friend when I was a kid were the friendly crickets. They were crickets and they were friendly. <laughs> and I loved them. We were best friends. Uh, Leanne. Okay, Leanne. Um, I don't think I had imaginary friends, but toy, um, growing up, I don't remember about my toys, but in my earliest memories, I have a stacks and stacks of a picture book. We call the picture book, but equivalent to top part of a pen, pen size. Mm -hmm. Top, majority of the top part is a picture, and bottom part is a word. Mm -hmm. But th these are not colored, mm -hmm. they're the pictures. Um, I've been reading that. That was uh, my earliest memory, and throughout childhood, always reading, didn't go out play much. <laughs> so that's it. I had sad but childhood, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound sad to me. <laughs> All right, let's go into the TV to Bangor first.
Okay. So, uh, my favorite childhood toy, uh, my dad bought me a four-wheeler, a little Kawasaki Bayou. Sweet. And what's your name? Sorry, Aaron? <laughs> oh, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron, sorry. <laughs> My name is Alexis, and uh, I can't really remember any of my favorite toys. It was, they were probably my brother's toys that I wasn't supposed to play with. They'd probably be my favorite. Yeah, I played with my brother's toys a lot as well. He did not like that. I had three older brothers, and they did not like that. Yeah. Uh, my name is Raylene, and... Let's see, my favorite childhood toy changed, obviously, when I was growing up, but I think the one I remember most was when I was really little, I had this floppy stuffed bunny, and he was pure white, and I named him Brain, and I don't know why, but there you go. Awesome. <laughs> my name is Scott, and my favorite toy was my army men, mm. and I still actually have some of them in an old ammo case. Nice. My name is Jeremy. Uh, my favorite childhood toys were the Lincoln Logs. Mm -hmm. Well, things that you can build. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Well, a lot of people don't know what those are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Betsy. Uh, I don't know that I had a favorite toy, but when I was like three, we had a pond duck, like a big swimming hole. So from like. By three to thirteen, that was my favorite thing to do mm. all year round. I think the world can count as a toy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Emily, and my favorite toy was probably a stuffed baby bop doll from like Army. A what doll? It's like Baby Bob. It was like the name of Baby the green Bob. dinosaur from Barney. Mm -hmm. huh. <laughs> I missed that one entirely. So, all right. <laughs> all right, let's go to Rockland. Hi, my name is Rachel, and I think probably my light bright. Oh, yeah. And just being outside, I used to play in mud with sticks a lot. <laughs> yes, also that. All right, thank you. And let's bring it back into Augusta. I'm Ryan. Uh, favorite childhood toy, uh, well, it's two stage. So when I was younger, it was my, uh, you know that show Elf? The guy, uh, that little alien dude. Yeah. Brown, he used to eat cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a stuffed animal with him. And then when I got older, it was uh, my slingshot. Mm. So. Um, Jennifer and my favorite early childhood toy was a little stuffed animal called Coochie. I don't know how I named him that, but um, I would sleep with him every night. And I remember being in crisis mode one night because I left it at my grandparents' house. So I refused to go to bed and my parents had to go get it. <gasps> and bring it home in order for me to go to bed that night. Wow. How far away did it? was South Gardner to Augusta, so 20 minute ride. Mm. But, yeah, it was a bad scene. Yeah. I didn't remember it. So, mm. yeah. So did nobody else have imaginary friends, or do you just not want to talk about them? No. <laughs> for your toys, your friends. Yeah. I uh, actually have taken an interest to this recently because I asked that in a couple of my classes about imaginary friends, and it's actually remarkably not that common. I think it would be like most kids, and it seems to be fewer than half. Anyways. All right. So uh, the two things that we're going to work on today, we're going to... Um, talk about the readings uh, and so we'll go around and if you have things to share uh, questions to ask passages that called out to you um, etc etc we'll go through that um, and then I'll gather or I'll talk about a few things just to make sure that uh, some of the most important things come out in conversation 
Uh, we'll take a break after that and then we'll talk about our first observation, uh, which everybody hopefully has been able to do. And we'll review kind of your experience and uh, what questions are kind of coming up that you might be able to bring forward to the next stages of your observations. Uh, so first of all, let's get started with the readings. Does anyone have something immediately that you'd like to start out with? Uh, Ryan, I see your hand. All right, so it's actually two, it's a two-part thing. So the first part is a question. It's on page 43, right before the last paragraph. It says, we represent our data, or we represent, we represent our data, partly based on participants' perspectives and partly based on our own interpretation, never clearly escaping our own personal sample study. Mm -hmm. So now when they're referring to personal sample study, do they mean like uh, kind of our own bias or like our own like sample pool type deal? So it's not really, we don't think that the, the, the findings are accurate unless we say they are. Mm -hmm. Is that what they're trying to say? I just don't understand what the personal sample yeah, that's a that's a good question. And I think that uh, first and foremost, it's talking about our bias and our perspectives, but also the way that we ask the questions, the things that we look for, the way we gather our data, the methods that we go through, the analysis process, all of that adds our own flavor into the study. Um, so, for example, in the beginning of the first chapter, when he was talking about when he was uh, presenting his research, at a conference and then all these other researchers said oh it would have looked like this if I had done it I would have done it this way they would have brought a different kind of stamp into it in part because of their biases and how they would view that but also in part because of their expertise as researchers and the things that they look for uh, the the methods that they know well um, the knowledge that they bring from previous research and those sorts of things so the main goal, or one of the main goals, I should say, with qualitative research, and particularly when we're dealing with some sort of uh, human population setting or even just an individual person, is we want to try to get to their perspective of what is going on. That's one of the major strengths of qualitative research is that we don't just get to see this kind of objective and outsider would think this. We are trying to get at what does the insider think about this so that we can understand that point of view. Uh, but we can only ever understand someone else's point of view through our own point of view. And so that's the challenge of qualitative research is to try to get to their perspective as much as possible, but recognizing when and where our perspective is still there. All right. And then, um, the second part um, is on page one three well, so the second paragraph says, our questions change during the process of research to reflect increased understanding of the problem. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that actually came to account when I did my first observation. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't stay, because the way the emergency department set up, I, was, I stayed in a little bit, but then realized I wasn't seeing as much as I could, so I moved to a more mobile, Ah. Like walking around, right? And um, after you know doing all my observations and writing it all down, I uh, I realized the question that I was asking <clears throat> was like next to impossible to answer just because of um, you know taking into consideration the same emergency department, right? So the people there that work there are used to slutty and crazy days, right? Mm -hmm. And then like what we were talking about before, how do you measure? like stress, so how am I supposed to, because my question was, um, how does time of day and activity of the emergency department influence patient, um, you know, medical staff or physician patient interaction? The thing is, is like you can't measure how their, how the interaction is going, because if they're there in the emergency department, they're there for a reason. So mm -hmm. even though it could have gone professional, it could have gone good, even if the patient is, it's all objective because the patient can be in misery, mm -hmm. even though that there's a good, good you know, good communication and good treatment going on, the patient's going to say it sucks, mm -hmm. while the other person's thinking that it's good, so it's hard to measure, like, the interaction because of the, the circumstances of it. Right. So I kind of, I actually have already changed my, my question to um, how noise level in the emergency department affects um, communication and decision making mm -hmm. amongst med medical staff. Uh -huh. so. Yeah, and that's interesting too. Um, so 
I don't know if I want to throw it out for discussion, but I think that, yeah, keep in mind, too, your own experiences, perhaps, while we're talking about the readings, because um, that the strength of qualitative research, when we can just kind of change on the fly, uh, when we recognize that the situation doesn't exactly match our uh, previous understanding or what we were previously looking for, we can look for other things as well or instead of. Um, I think that that is definitely one of the strengths that we see. That's also one of the things that uh, separates the difference between uh, sitting down in this nice, more or less quiet environment and thinking through what are we going to be doing and talking through logistics and then actually being in the field and recognizing there's just other stuff that we didn't think of first. Qualitative research allows you to look at that other stuff in a way that if you had a survey it, you might never have noticed or found out about like the noise level or things like that. So. Yeah, interesting. You just, you just don't realize it <clears throat> coming from the standpoint where I'm working. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how noisy it is in there until you're actually not working. Yeah. It's absolutely great because when I'm there, I'm there for a purpose, right? And then I pick up on different stuff when I'm working because I'm you know, trained to listen for alarms or, you know, picking up other people's coughing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when I'm there, it was just like chaos. All right. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What else do we have? Uh, mine is page 40, second line from the top, and it talks about uh, her silent voice, and I'm not sure how to interpret her silent voice. Mm -hmm. So the silenced voices, this is at the top of page 40. Um, this is basically groups of people or uh, people within populations that don't have the power to speak up about what uh, they are experiencing. And uh, qualitative research, other types of research too, but qualitative research can be very powerful in um, helping to give rise to that voice. Um, so for example, I had a colleague who is working with uh, domestic violence issues. And um, one of the things that we see in families where there is domestic violence is that uh, there's kind of a public narrative that they show to the rest of the world, but then there's their own kind of internal individual experiences. And then that too is going to be different from if it's a parent or if it's a child and that sort of thing. And so some voices are not able to kind of speak up and um, I guess project their reality into the world. Um, and again, if you, have a, if you have a survey and you have very specific questions already that you're asking, or if you have, um, I don't know, any other sort of predetermined but not open sort of research where it's open to uh, finding different data, uh, then you might miss those things entirely, but having that one-on-one -on -one interaction and having that field aspect of the research allows you to get into um, into the things that are often overlooked. Yes. So, uh, I don't know if you could hear, but Leanne said you have to have skill to draw the voices out <laughs> um, and to, to notice those things, and someone who doesn't have the skill may not be able to, and that is absolutely true. And so, number one, if you're interested in this sort of work and this sort of research, uh, practice that skill and look for um, ways to encourage that within your own professional development. We'll be working on kind of the foundational pieces of that within this course, um, but by no means uh, we're not going to walk out of this course just ready for every situation, right? Uh, we'll have a good knowledge or a good sense of what we know and what we still can further our, uh, our learning. So keep taking classes on this sort of thing and practicing. Um, you can probably think of people uh, 
Yeah, we're in an election year, so you're seeing people on TV a lot right now who do not have good listening skills, yeah, but who can talk a lot, yeah. Has anyone seen that on TV recently? Oh, people skills in general, yeah, exactly. So um, <laughs> maybe some of our largest like political figures or political pundits that we're seeing on TV would not be really great at working with you know vulnerable populations or getting to nuanced understanding of uh, what's going on in various pockets of our country, um, but other folks would be able to have that that skill to have those conversations and to ask the right questions and to notice what information is missing. Uh, this is also one of the pieces that you'll find between uh, your first observation and your later observations, uh, your first interview and your second interview. When you're going over the data that you've already gathered, a lot of your preparation for your next piece is to figure out what data you haven't gathered yet that you didn't it didn't occur to you yet um, that you haven't gathered it and so it takes a lot of thought and a lot of effort yeah all right um, I really enjoyed this reading this yeah. week because I felt like it resonated with what I do more so than the other book mm -hmm. which is weird to me and it, it flowed better mm -hmm. But um, I went back to page two, and I just felt um, in the first paragraph where they when they talked about like how you introduce the study, including the formation of the purpose, the research question, data collection, data analysis, report writing, and standard of validation and evaluation. Like, like having worked in this world for a while, like if you miss any one of those steps, things fall apart. Mm -hmm. So to me, like that's so valuable in that one little sentence. So mm -hmm. that was my impression. Yeah. So yeah, the page two, first paragraph, um, just having so much uh, information. And thank you also uh, for sharing your uh, professional experience within this uh, and, and just recognizing that all of these pieces and all of these steps really are necessary, even though it seems like sometimes a tedious burden to go through this process. This is what makes it uh, rigorous and valid science um, is to have all of these things together. And also I'm glad you enjoyed the book. When I was rereading these chapters I was I felt like I was in grad school again. I was so excited to have finally found you know this this is what I want to do. Um, and yeah I love this book a lot. <laughs> I want to share it with co-workers. Please do. Yeah. All right, let's move into Bangor, Rockland. Who else has stuff to share? On page 10, uh, it talks about positioning myself. It talks about the pure approaches to research design. Mm -hmm. And as an interdisciplinary student, I have a hard time with that. Yeah. Taking just one approach to a thing. And then you said that we can only see other people's perspectives through our own, mm -hmm. which is really um, goes with the interdisciplinary for me, which also goes against the pure mm -hmm. approaches. Like, I don't feel like you can really see something if you're only looking at it through one lens, especially somebody else's world. Yeah. That's difficult for me to um, practice. Yeah. And that makes sense too with you, Betsy, especially with the interdisciplinary focus that you have in your study. You're already used to using multiple lenses at the same time. Uh, and I think what he was writing to at this point was that most students uh, are coming from a specific discipline, and so they do have a, they're used, more used to just having one specific focus. Uh, but even throughout the chapter, he talks about how these, these lenses overlap, and very often you'll wind up using multiple lenses within a singular, within a single study. And um, I think that that's where you're going to find some strength. For you personally, um, I think that that's going to work. Um, and then also, the, uh, within the strengths of qualitative researchers, and now I'm thinking back through my memory, is that in this book or was this in the uh, Strauss and Corbin, uh, where they were talking about one of the um, major 
valuable qualities of a qualitative researcher is being comfortable with ambiguity and the fact that there is not just one story. Uh, there are many stories and we are going to see one or maybe a few of them, um, but it's still only part of the perspective at which, uh, through which you can look at this singular case or this singular event. So again, for you personally, Betsy, I think you'll, <laughs> you'll be comfortable with that ambiguity. Um, on page 43, it talks about throughout the slow process of collecting data and analyzing them, mm -hmm. we shape our narrative, a narrative with many forms and qualitative research. Could you explain that a little better? Sure. Because I don't, I've already done research, which you know about, mm -hmm. but I thought I had already done the narrative. Yeah, the narrative in this sense, there, there are a couple of different ways that we use the, that same term narrative in research. Uh, so the narrative can be our proposal, what we want to do for the research, what we intend to get out of it, what we are hoping to find, and this is the description of how we're going to do it. Um, the narrative, and I think in this sense what he's talking about, can also be our report of what we have found. So once we have done the data collection, once we've done the analysis, then we have to tell other people what we did and what we learned, and that's part of the narrative. So what is it that you are going to tell others that you learned from this process, from, from this research? Um, what is the description of the data findings? What is, to the best of your ability to report, the participant's perspective of the topic? What is your own perspective, having learned from so many different uh, participants or um, sites or activities or different uh, pieces of data that you collected? So that, I think, that, that reporting to describe what you have learned is going to be a big part of the narrative here. Uh, later on in this book, and I think actually starting next week, we're going to be talking about different types of research, and one of those types of research is narrative research. <laughs> and so yet again, another way that we use narrative, um, and this is a much more storytelling approach. So for example, uh, life histories. Um, would be a narrative research when you're describing the life that somebody had or if you are using a, you can use narrative to bring in the thick description, the rich description of reality and experience uh, by telling stories of people. Um, other people like to do their reporting much more um, methodologically based so these were my methods, these were my procedures, these are my findings, and keep it very, uh, I don't know, non-narrative. Systematic. Systematic, sure, that's a good word. Um, but in this sense, I think so he's... The yeah. yeah, the findings. The methodology is the findings. No, the, the narrative would be the findings, yeah. The narrative, yeah. Okay. yeah. Methodology would be the method you took to get the findings. Yes. Right, and that's why I thought you just said methodology. I'm not hearing you. Mm. Well, I'm still recording here. This is going to be a great YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> like me I on thought, YouTube. Uh, on page 39, uh, as I've seen before, I was trying to struggling with what my research that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I came across the emergent design yeah. as part of one of the characteristics for qualitative research, it was like I was reading my 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 methodology for my project right there. It's like yep. the research process for qualitative researchers is emergent. I was like, that's fantastic. Like, yeah. that's, I had no idea what questions to be asking. Uh, and I found in my first observation project, which we talked about a little bit, I was supposed to observe a game and they both got canceled so it ended up being a practice. Um, one of the things I thought I'd be looking for is the, you know, the demeanors of the girls on the soccer team and what I found, um, and I think this is part of the emergent design, is that that's what it wasn't what I was looking for at all, where it's sixth to eighth graders. I think what I'm going to be looking for more is the dynamic difference between the girls that are the eighth graders and the ones that are the sixth graders mm. and just how 
vastly different they were watching them in this practice. You know, like the eighth graders are task driven, they're a little more serious, they're dressed how they're supposed to be for practice, whereas the sixth graders I found are got tie-dye shirts on, there's a lot of horseplay, they're running around, they chasing butterflies, you know, and it's mm -hmm. kind of, um, my questions have started to emerge as I, you know, started to do this first observation. So, um, you know, the more I read through this, um, I'm, I'm more encouraged mm -hmm. by, uh, by not feeling like I'm so absolutely lost on what the heck am I not supposed to be doing here, looking for here. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think the, the emergent design is also something that we see a lot in grounded theory. And so the Strauss and Corbin book is looking specifically through the grounded theory lens, um, where you're looking to see what where does the data take you, basically. Um, and since we are learning how to do qualitative research while we are doing qualitative research, uh, you're going to rely on that emergent design a lot because the more you learn throughout the semester, you're going to think, oh yeah, I can also do this now that I'm halfway through my project. Um, and that's fine. Next time, some future semester when you're doing research uh, separately after this class, you can apply all of that from the beginning maybe. But there's still going to be uh, things, that, that emergence of understanding of how to look at this situation versus how I thought. I was going to look at that situation. Your story yeah, also. I, I did look at it um, on the other side of that too, where it says um, that all phases of the process may change or shift after the researcher enters the field and begin to collect data. I mean, I looked at it as an encouraging thing, but I don't want to also be discouraged by, I think, what you just said. That I get halfway through and be like, this is not what I'm looking for at all. Like, what the heck is going on here? No, no, no. So, yeah, and thank you for yeah. clarifying because it's not. Uh, when you get to that point where you realize you you should be looking at things differently, what brought you to that point is data that brought you to that point, and that's how you know you should be looking at things differently. So you don't throw it all out because you realize new things you can add into it. You move forward from where you're at. So yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Um, on page 40, somewhere in the middle of that really large paragraph, uh -huh. it talks about minimizing the um, power relationships between the researchers and process uh, participants. Yes. And it talks about how we might collaborate with them um, by having them review our research questions or um, collaborate during the data analysis and interpretation phase of the research. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a situation really where that would be beneficial to anything except for like rapport building just because I don't know really what they can bring to the table not knowing as, as much about the, the research project that we're doing. Yeah. That's a really, uh, that's a good question um, because one of the things uh, or a couple of things that we want to keep in mind, uh, this par huge long paragraph is all about the ethics of research and so being aware of that power dynamic, uh, number one, can lead us to understand that we do need to have a certain amount of rapport building definitely. So if I walk in, I mean, look at how fancy I am, I got my jacket on, I got a PhD, and if I walk in with a clipboard and say, hi, I'm Dr. Corlew, tell me what you know, there's going to be kind of an intimidation factor, right? If I am using my power in this setting, um, folks who do not share that power or who are not comfortable around it are uh, going to behave differently. So it's not going to be very natural. I'm not going to get a full amount of that. So number one, absolutely, rapport building is very important, and people knowing you as a person, knowing where you're coming from knowing what's important to you can make a huge difference. Uh, so for example, uh, with my master's thesis research when I was looking at the super fairy protests, I found that being from the university on Oahu where like they were basically fighting against that island uh, in a lot of their conceptions, uh, for me to go in and sit down and start asking questions, I could see a question in their minds, what is she going to use this for? Is she going to use this data against me or is she going to use it to help me? What is her purpose here? And so me sitting down and saying, I come from an activist background, this is what I care about, talking about my family, talking about the things that I've done in my life, like it did actually allow us to have a deeper conversation. So number one, it can enrich the, the data that we get. 
Uh, another aspect, though, is that um, it really can help improve your study. When I first went to Tuvalu to uh, find out what I could find out about the country and the culture and what they needed from climate change, I found collaborators. That was one of the first things that I tried to do because I was able to talk with them and say, I think this is important. Does this seem important to you? And then they can tell me, well, no, we already know all about this. It's just new to you. Or, yeah, that's total crap. That's not true at all. Or, yes, that's really on to something. And so they can kind of inform the questions that you ask or inform uh, the ways that you ask them or the process by which you get this information in ways that we as kind of outsiders and as researchers may not be able to access. Uh, in addition, especially when you're working with vulnerable populations or when you're working with a, uh, a topic or a population where there is something that is deeply important in their lives and they want to make effective change and you are working on that topic, I think ultimately we're going to want the people we're working with in our research to be able to use our research. And that means making research that they can use. And again, that's a way that they're going to be able to inform the research. So for example, um, right now, uh, today I was seeing all sorts of new news about more police shootings of African American men, and there's been civil unrest, there's all sorts of things that are going on. People are, you know, very upset. We've kind of reached a crisis point with a lot of this. And so if I walk into Black Lives Matter movement, uh, me as a white researcher from Maine, and I'm like, hey, tell me all this stuff. I'm a doctor, I can record this. Um, I might come up with something useful, but I also might be looking at it from exactly the wrong perspective that they'll never be able to use um, in order to move their movement forward or to achieve peace or any of their goals, you know. Um, however, if I'm collaborating with the community and with uh, the people who are actually embroiled in all of this, uh, then they can say, this is what we really need and how can you help us move this forward? And it can be very powerful. <laughs> It can also be very time consuming, but it's awesome. When you have the time to do it, it's amazing to be able to actually put that time in. Okay, that makes more sense. I was kind of thinking it as a perspective of like, if you're studying, especially kind of what we're doing, we're studying specific people mm -hmm. and their certain behaviors. If we're like, hey, come check out what I'm going to oh. <laughs> wrong. Yeah, maybe in your observation research right now. <laughs> I was thinking about that poor girl in the classroom last week. <laughs> you guys went and watched her classroom. If you sat down and asked her, how can we observe you better? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Hi. Rachel. I don't have, I mean, I have a lot of things that I highlighted throughout the chapters that I thought were important or I wanted to remember, but overall I just wanted to say um, that I found these two chapters much, um, much more helpful in terms of description and definitions and ex examples and explanations of the ideas of the process and what qualitative research was. The first chapter in the other textbook I probably got about halfway through and handed it to my husband and said, what I get to read. Oh. <laughs> so I'm glad the rest of that book wasn't like that because I was like, oh my gosh. It was like reading Shakespeare. I don't, I have so much going on and I don't want to try to decipher what this person is saying in all of these deep, fancy words because now I need to co-read with a dictionary. So this was a lot more straightforward, simple, more of a map. So I appreciated that. <laughs> All right, okay, so we already heard from Jen saying that. Leanne says she agrees too. I want to ask you guys, how did you all experience this book versus the other book? Similar? Much better. Uh, yeah. Much easier reading. Okay, did anyone have more trouble reading this book than the other book? 
Quality Research. <laughs> <laughs> he said it's the idiot's guide to qualitative research. <laughs> I mean, it, it breaks it down so much easier. I feel like if we would have read these chapters before we read the other ones, mm -hmm. the other ones might have made a little more sense. Okay. What about Bangor? Are we seeing more or less agreement with that? Yeah. 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 Thumbs up. Okay. Does anyone disagree? Does anyone have a different reading style and you thought, nope, this was awful? The other one is excellent? All right. This is good feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> I so rarely have a class tell me things like this. Uh, my future students, thank you. So, all right. What else do we got? This level of discussion here is still uh, suitable for upper level, uh, division student or graduate students to ask it. So I'm reading uh, upper level. I feel proud to read this book. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you should. <laughs> like Rachel said earlier, mm -hmm. first book that we read, I haven't picked out the dictionary for years mm. but for that book I pulled out the dictionary huh. and I was looking through the word after words it was really tiresome by the time I read maybe one or two paragraphs I forgot what, what I read in the mm. beginning so it was really difficult okay <laughs> okay this is good to know thank you guys what is an a priori theory <sighs> Just a bit. Oh, yes, would you like to read from Google? Um, if it would come up, I would. <laughs> well, um, the notes I took was priori theory was knowledge gained deductively. Okay, which kind of goes against qualitative research, though, right? Because isn't qualitative research supposed to be in the freedom? It says a priori is a philosophical term that is used in several different ways. The term is supposed to mean um, knowledge that is gained through deduction and not through empirical evidence. For instance, I have two apples now and I plan to add three apples, I will have five apples. This knowledge is gained deductively. So within uh, research, when we're talking about a priori theory, uh, what we mean is that we look through uh, what we learn and then we basically apply theories to it after the fact. Uh, rather than walking in with the specific theory that we are looking for. In my other research methods, they compared it to Sherlock Holmes. There was a, there was a case about a, a murder and that the dog never barked when the person was murdered, so therefore the dog knew the, per knew the murderer. So it was like deductive reasoning mm -hmm. as to that's elementary. <laughs> <laughs> and it is an awesome show. <laughs> I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan in all of the many iterations. But that I could wrap yes. my head around because he didn't, it's not like he collected a survey. He went and he observed. He mm -hmm. asked questions and gathered right. information. Yeah. And then creating a theory from that, rather than if I was going to walk in um, with a specific theory that I'm going to go in and test. Yeah. Who was that, by the way, who asked about a priori? Oh, Raylene? All right. I knew I was going to get that question. <laughs> huh? Uh, there's a couple folks left, correct? You know who you are. All right, so one of the things I had a problem with is trying to figure out what my problem really is. Yeah. Jeremy asked a question to help me figure it out, so here it is. 
Would you like to share? Oh, yeah. Well, the problem is? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, like the problem is like what I was trying to, I didn't know really what I was looking for. And then he brought the fact that he was looking at different age groups. So, and I didn't even think of that at first. So, now I am. Look at different age groups of homeless people. Mm -hmm. And interaction. Gotcha. And I think we have uh, Emily and Lexi. Do either of you have anything to add? Um, on page 45, where it gives a short list of characteristics for a good quality of study, um, I really like the, like the fourth bullet point because when I did my first observation, I was kind of like, I was trying really hard to focus on like the one topic that I um, chose for my observations, which was interaction between people who push their call bells um, like excessively. But as I was um, observing, I kind of noticed like a lot of other things that kind of played a role in that. And it says that after you understand your like core concept, then you can start introducing um, and comparing other aspects of the situations. And I thought that went along really well with what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. All right. And Lexi, we talked a bit earlier. Do you have anything to add right now? All right. So um, a couple of things that I did want to make sure uh, came out of this uh, reading, other than I was really hoping that all of you would love this book as much as I do, so check, um, is that goal and that striving for uh, trying to understand the participant uh, point of view. And so uh, with all of these skills and with all of the mindset that we are trying to develop as we're going into our qualitative research, the main goal is to look past what we know already walking in and what we think we know or what we expect to find and instead try to figure out what's happening in the mindsets of other people who are experiencing the situation, the events, et cetera, et cetera, differently than us because they are somehow much more connected into it than we are. Or even if it's a topic that or a setting that we are a part of, trying to figure out other people's perspectives as well as our own perspective. Uh, and I think that that's one of the, the biggest things that we're doing, even with observational research, is trying to figure out how are people navigating these situations and what do these situations mean to them. And so a lot of the work that we're doing, uh, trying to gain these skills, is, is just trying to get us prepared to look past our own perspective and our own mindset, our own worldview, our own background, our own knowledge, and even our own expertise, and try to figure out what this means to other people who do not have that same background that we do. Does that make sense? Um, and the importance of gathering very descriptive data. And so that is, uh, again, a huge strength within qualitative research is that we get to look beyond just the very specific narrow topic of what we're looking for. Uh, our question can bring us with a uh, specific purpose or mindset that brings us to a setting, but then we have the ability to look beyond just that one thing. And so we've heard a couple of people kind of example that. Uh, so Ryan uh, noticing the sound difference might be a really important thing. And uh, Emily noticing that there are other things within the setting that are making or having influence on what's going on. Jeremy noticing uh, that he was just going to look at the interactions, but then realizing that there's age difference interactions and things like that. So even though you walk in with a certain perspective or uh, looking for certain things, if you only very specifically look at that thing, then you're going to miss all the other stuff that's going on as well that might have very rich data to it. So that's part of when we're doing these uh, descriptions, when we're taking our uh, notes, our field notes, and trying to 
catalog and figure out as much as we can of what's going on. The more descriptive we are with all of the things, the better picture we'll have in our mind, but also the better picture we'll be able to portray to other folks. And that, again, is a really uh, huge strength within qualitative research, this ability to have rich, very con context-rich data that we can bring others into the, the participants' perspective much better than they could have if we just say, well, 80% of people do this. Why? What does it mean to them? That's where we're going to we're going to get all the interesting, fun stuff. We talked about some of the power and the ethics and the things to keep in mind. Um, and I've talked about this a little bit with a couple of you, just keeping in mind uh, how we as researchers can influence the setting that we are in. So for example, if um, uh, Aaron, you're watching uh, or an area where there's a lot of uh, homeless people. Um, so if you walk in and you're with a suit, or if you're wearing a police officer uniform, if you're like different ways in which we dress or behave are going to change the way people are behaving around us. And so kind of keeping that part in mind, but then also keeping in mind the power that we have by nature of our expertise and uh, what we bring to the study. And so this, again, would be adding into what Raylene was uh, talking about and asking about earlier. We have this knowledge, or at least we are gaining this knowledge about how to do research. This can be very valuable, very beneficial to a lot of communities. And they may have a good sense of, I know something is happening with this, but I don't fully understand what, or I don't know how to explain it to other people. We can kind of bring in that piece. How do we find out more about this, and how do we explain it to other people? While well, the community can be the source of the, the strong community expertise, this is what it's actually like here. So being able to bring uh, our methodology and our researcherness into this can be quite powerful. Does anyone have any other uh, questions? Jeremy, I think I see a hand. Um, yeah, I was thinking um, how uh, how my plans kind of changed uh, where I was supposed to observe. I originally was going to do her soccer games where I kind of I had to adjust to do one of her practices. I think it might have been a kind of a blessing in disguise uh, because when I read over the natural setting part of it, uh, it kind of, I don't know, it's probably not the definition of it, but where I can compare um, how the dynamics of, of, a, of, a, of a practice as opposed to a game on top of the, the age differential. Um, when I was reading Natural Setting, I can't help but like hear the Steve Irwin's voice of like I'm observing these 12 year old, 11 to 14 year old girls in their natural habitat, you know, yeah. without just like knowing that I'm there. Um, one thing I did find though is I walked up there with my daughter and she knew what I was doing. So when they started to practice, when they did their warm-up lap, she like zooms around the field like <laughs> twice as fast as everybody else. Uh -huh. And like comes back and is like standing in front of me panting, like, you know, like, oh, my dad's watching. He's doing observations of my practice. I'm going to go out there and, you know, act like I don't normally act. So mm -hmm. uh, that begs the question of um, you, when you compare natural setting as opposed to um, how do they refer to it in here? A contrived situation. Right. Being the, in a lab or in a controlled environment, uh -huh. I guess. So um, I, I, I like that to comparing, you know, where there's practice, where there's more horseplay and it's more casual atmosphere than when they're in a game. Mm -hmm. There's another team with people they don't know and the task is at hand here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if those are some of the things, or they are going to be some of the things that play into the questions that I have, the comparisons that I make. So, right. Yeah, and so in terms of terminology, uh, both are the natural setting. Like, I definitely see the distinction you're making between the one where they have very specific tasks in mind versus one where it's a little bit more playtime. Um, and I think that that's going to be very rich data for your study. Um, but the natural setting, like within qualitative research, is the world outside of my office and outside of my laboratory. So both the game and the practice are both natural settings. Um, this would be versus if I bring folks into a laboratory and say, talk about your marriage, and then I have like cameras pointed at them, versus if I'm you know, sitting in Starbucks and two folks are at the table next to me talking about their marriage. That's a very different sort of conversation that they're gonna have there versus in my lab. And uh, this can be even, you know, 
uh, if I call someone into an interview and we sit in my office um, and I ask them all of these questions, that might be very different than if I go to their house and ask them even the same questions, I can get, I might be getting very different sorts of answers because they feel and behave differently there. Um, and then again, all right, easy, right? <laughs> um, so if I uh, am interviewing people in my office versus in their home, or if I bring people in and then uh, contrive a situation. So uh, in developmental psychology, we have the strange situation, right? So that calls into a lab and then we leave the kid alone in a laboratory and then come back and see how they respond to their caregiver coming back. So if I actually have a sterile laboratory setting that's like a doctor's office and a chair, and I leave a baby alone in this lab, they're gonna freak out no matter what. Now if I set it up to look like a playroom and um, it's a much more natural sort of setting that babies might find themselves in, they're gonna behave more like they would. But even better would be if I could do this actually in their home where they're used to all of the space and all of the toys and the people coming and going and that sort of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> I ran into sort of that problem of being unnatural in a seemingly natural setting because I thought to do my research, I'd be putting myself in places that I typically am at anyways, um, observing parent and child. Mm -hmm. But in order to do good research, I can't have my children there. So I show up in a library in a children's room watching children with no children with me mm -hmm. and at a playground with no children with me watching people's children mm -hmm. so my husband said call me when you need to be bailed out <laughs> uh, so i didn't i didn't think of that but then i started kind of feeling like some creepy stalker mm -hmm. So I tried to blend in. I sat off to the side. I pretended to be looking for books when I first started out and put a, a pile next to me. Maybe I was waiting for somebody. Nobody knew. Right, right. So did anyone call the cops on you? No, no. I did get, um, there was one father and a son at the playground. They're the only people ever there. And I did see him kind of pop up and look at me a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I just, I tried to sort of like, over or from under my my brow line just sort of pick up and see what they were doing all the time but uh -huh. then i just probably looked angry <laughs> uh but yeah that's that's definitely a thing that we have to keep in mind with our natural setting is how do we make it unnatural with our presence <laughs> so i think that would be part of their reflexivity and again part of the data yeah. too do people notice you do they not notice you? Does that matter in any way? Because sometimes it might matter, sometimes it might not. Um, but just, yeah, at least something to, to make note of. I put our waitress on edge because I walked into the restaurant with a notebook. Oh. Not normal. Mm -hmm. And so every time she came over, she would check what I was doing. Mm -hmm. like, and if I was writing or she was hyper conscious. Yeah. And I could see that. Mm -hmm. And then after an hour, a gentleman at the next table kind of like kept looking over a little bit more mm -hmm. at us. Because like, I did have a friend, so it was under the pretense. Like, I was having dinner, we're chatting, writing down. But mm -hmm. after an hour, people were catching on. <laughs> like, I gotta go. <laughs> Ah, oh, research. I love this stuff. All right, does anyone have anything else about the readings right now? All right, well, I'm very glad that you enjoyed the book. We're going to take a break for maybe 15 minutes. We'll come back at, let's say, um, 20 to 25, and then we'll talk about our specific uh, research experiences. I know we've already gotten to a couple of them already, but we'll just chat about how that has gotten started. So... You're free for a few minutes. Recording once more. We are going to talk about our research. How has it been going? 
Um, so what I'm very interested particularly is what was your experience, anything unexpected, etc., uh, from doing your first observation? Um, and then also to start thinking about as you've looked through your data since then, hopefully using that exact same process that we used in class last week where you go through it multiple times uh, to kind of tidy it up and then to start looking for themes and patterns and etc. Uh, if you have already kind of found or thought of new things that you want to fold into your observations in the second, third, and fourth. Um, and then any other questions or experiences you have. I'm interested in all of this. So what do you got to tell me? I, um, because of the weather, I only got to, oh, that's terrible, that feedback. <laughs> oh, no. Here, let me, um, I'm going to mute. I only got to see the pre-K pre kids, not, I was going to do pre-K versus fourth. And I think I can get enough, um, it was interesting to watch and I feel like the more I watch, the more patterns I can find just within that. Do you mind if I narrow my observations? Narrowing is often a very good thing to find in your observations. Yeah. Okay. If that makes sense to you, absolutely. Any other um, questions or thoughts from your first observation, Betsy? Um, I... I'm not sure what I'm looking at most of the time because there are like four and it's chaos on the playground. <laughs> but I don't know. I swear, it's only 15 minutes, so it's not really extensive, so it's more intensive. Like I need to suss out things that happen more often. Like in my second observation, you know, what also happens in the second observation that happened in the first observation. And I feel like that's where my questions will come from when I find those patterns because it's really chaos and there's no rhyme or reason to it <laughs> at all. So it'll, it's fun. I mean, it's fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, um, like we were talking about just before break, they can't see me, so they don't know that I'm there looking out a window like a creep. So it doesn't affect them at all. All right. Uh, do you think that the 15-minute increments are going to give you enough data to, like, answer some questions, tell a story, that sort of thing, or you're going to have to do additional observations in order to get that? Um, I can, um, yes, more observations. I can go, you know, two or three times a week to make it more often. So 15 minutes a time, you know, a couple times a week, half hour, 45 minutes of observation of weekly, I think, um, I think I'll get enough to find a story in it. Okay. Yes. Um, so where the the blocks are so small, can could you you know because you're so worried about missing things, right? So what if I mean I don't know if this is possible, but if you're watching kids and you have like let's say your phone, you could put that by the window as well. So you can focus on a particular thing while your phone's recording. So once you see something. You can look for that, and then you can look at your phone to catch anything else that you might have missed. So you actually have extra data that way. I mean, I don't know if that's something you can do for a school. <laughs> you mean legally? <laughs> but uh, as long as you're not saving the, the, the videos, I would assume that you could just... Posting them online. Right. So right. just using it as like a like a tool for reference, right? So if you see something and you want to observe this behavior, while doing that, and then once you write down your notes for that 15 minutes, you can actually use that video to pick up on another behavior as well. So you're getting two complex That's more. a great idea. Because mm -hmm. it's a pretty big, uh, I mean, it's a playground. There are, there are only, was it 51 kids, but it's a pretty big space, so to watch like three groups, that's a really great idea. If like you can watch that. one and then have your, your phone facing another way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, that's a great idea. You are certainly allowed in terms of this class. Um, again, try not to get arrested, <laughs> as always. Um, but, but yeah, I think especially given the time constraints of the 15-minute block, uh, try the phone. If it doesn't work, then yeah, you can always go a few more times than four if you need additional data to uh, strengthen your study. Absolutely. Katie, I... Um I also am narrowing mine down. Mm -hmm. um, 
when I when I first went to the, the mall, I was just going to observe um, the cohorts and see, you know, the three different groups who goes the most during this time period or these time periods. But I think what I'm narrowing it down to um, is technology versus moods. Um, people who have the technology using it and the people that are around them uh, either walking with them or people that they're trying to avoid while they're walking or whatever um, because I've, I've noticed some things when I went over my notes um, for my transcripts that there there seems to be even in the younger generation there seems to be more anger when their friends are on the phone and then you see them get on their device, it's like they're almost being ignored. And, and it, it's the same with couples or even the older people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where I'm going to narrow, narrow my down is to technology versus the moon. Mm, interesting. I think that would be a very interesting study. And I also like how it kind of came out of your just general observations of um, how people are interacting with each other. So, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay, so mine, like I, like I mentioned before, I'm changing the direction of mine to um, I actually wrote it down. Uh, so my new question is, does increased noise level attribute to communication interference and disruption of decision making in complex procedures? So the reason I kind of went in this direction is because, uh, like I said before, the other one was just too hard to measure with you know physicians having you know 10 patients, possibly up to 15 patients apiece in the ED at one time. It's hard to monitor all the interactions. But with the I can monitor um, a little bit easier the how noisy things are and how communication gets screwed up because they have an EG status board, which I have access to, and it's, it doesn't have patients' names, it just has initials, so I have no idea who the patients are. Mm -hmm. But it says what room they're in, you know, their initials, what room they're in, why they're here, so the medical reason they're there, um, and actually how long they've been there. Mm -hmm. So I can look at it. I mean, there's some patients when I've been working that have been in the ED, like I'll see them at 3 o'clock in the morning to do something with them, and they've been there since 6 o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. So obviously the activity level is obviously affecting the, um, not so much level of care, but like decision making, you know, whether to keep them, you know, to admit them, or to go here, to go there. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a little bit easier, kind of narrows it down for me to where I can use that status for along with um, because then also with how long they've been there um, it says you know are they getting admitted or um, who's been contacted or if there's imaging pending or whatever so I can also look at how long something's been pending and everything else mm -hmm. so I can use all that data mm -hmm. with it being anonymous I mean I don't know I mean, the initials could be one of a million people right mm -hmm. so at least that way, the you know the other times that I go in, there's going to be. I mean, you obviously have your frequent flyers, right? The chronically ill or the people that just think they're chronically ill and just like to come in. Mm -hmm. um, versus all these other people, so I'll have. I mean, they have up to I think it's like forty something rooms that they can actually put people into. Mm -hmm. So you got to think the next like, 120 participants in this actual thing to you know study or research project. So I can kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. Makes it a little more concrete. Right. There's right. too many, you know, let's put it the other way, it was too many, um, too many unknowns, too many ways to go off. And I want to find myself being at the end of it and still having a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So mm -hmm. that's why I that. Mm -hmm. And I found it like when I was looking at my observations, you know, I had auditory, visual, you know, I like smell, touch, all those different things. And I just, but, uh, um, auditory and visual were the biggest ones. So from the auditory, or more so the auditory because the visual, I mean, it's chaotic, but it's not really, if you're focused, it's not really taking it away, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just all the different sounds that I noticed, so. Mm -hmm. 
that's why I went from that. And then I actually looked, because um, of my whole thought process of going this way, I actually looked online and they have a copious amount of information to go along these lines to kind of help me steer me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So. So the, uh, the board with the data on it, are you able to record that or bring that into, like out of that particular time frame? Yeah. Do you have it with you so that you can compare it with your notes later and that sort of yeah. thing? Yeah, so what I okay. can do is I just asked when I was in there, because I know the charge mirrors really well. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, like, there, so I was like, do you mind if I mm -hmm. take a snapshot of the ED status board? I mean, it's, I mean the, the ED status board they have up mm -hmm. is out in the hallway so everybody can see. Okay. So I mean, it's not like it's a, you know, Very private, right? Exactly. Right, right. Yes, definitely. Um, what is that? Is that governing board? Mm -hmm. HIPAA. Thank you. Yeah. I said, oh, <laughs> 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 so it's definitely HIPAA approved. So okay, right. I can just walk in and take a snap of that for the East Street. That's why I can at least put that in my, my observations, right? Just attach that picture and then mm -hmm. take that to my actual research. So right, right. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Um, so I am got am the excuse me. I am going to point out here uh, during the break while I was not recording and while I was muted from the other sites as well. Leanne and I were talking about her observation um, as well, and there's a very it's kind of similar thing that came up, which was uh, she realized that there is additional data that is available to her that would help potentially uh, kind of enliven or richen her um, her qualitative her observation and so Ryan's seeing this too where he has this uh, what he's able to actually see but then being able to compare it with this other data uh, this artifact of data that he's able to access um, can really help with that uh, Leon's actually came from the idea that when she started doing her observations she realized that at least in these first two observations that she's done uh, she wasn't able to observe half of the people that she was hoping to compare. So she has like two populations the first time admitted versus recurring admissions, but so far it's only been recurring admissions while she's been doing her observations. And what happens if she goes two more times for observations and she never sees the first time? Well, crap, there's no comparison there, right? You can't compare if you don't see it. And this is part of research. Hooray! We go in and hope to see something and then it never happens. We go in and hope to see something that we know happens all the time and then it doesn't happen while we happen to be there. Um, that's pretty normal, actually. And so uh, her looking at other aspects of data kind of came from this idea of I can't do Potentially, I might not be able to do what I set out to do. So then there's the question, okay, what can I do with the data that I have? And so she's found this other pieces of data that might be able to help her make other comparisons uh, with the observations that she's had. Am I representing that all correctly? Yes. All right. So, um, but because we had this conversation, I wanted, it, wanted to share it with the rest of you because um, number one, that happens all the time where we go out and look for things and it doesn't happen while we, while we are looking. Um, and that's very frustrating for researchers, um, but it's also part of research and we have to follow the data. We can't follow what we know or believe might be out there beyond what we saw. We can only use the data that we saw in our research and in our reporting. Um, and so if we're not able to get at exactly what we want, we can use other data or we can uh, alter our questions like Jeremy was talking about earlier with the kind of emergent design. Um, we can start seeing, okay, well, what is it that I'm able to focus on? And then with uh, Leanne and Ryan both using outside or uh, different sources of data than just their observations, it's a way to kind of potentially make rich, more rich their data. Um, and that is an opportunity that is open to all of you if there's something that you think would help your data um, be better, or be more full, uh, definitely take advantage of it. You're not required, obviously, to do this, but if you can think of ways that other things might tie in well, well, that's a good part of qualitative research as well. So it would be okay if I did like a floor plan of the restaurant to help me identify like where I sat and the tables around me? Yes. Okay, because I did do that, but I wasn't sure if that was... Yes, absolutely. Okay. And that might help with the playground situation too. Oh yeah, that's true, Betsy.
it. Other thoughts, reports? I want to hear from all of you. I almost feel like. All right. <laughs> um, I almost feel like my first observation was kind of a dud because I didn't get really a lot of what I wanted to. Um, for example, I am looking at how adult moms interact with their children on the playground versus teen moms, um, what kind of language they use in their behavior and stuff. I don't really find that my questions are changing. Um, or I think I've only done one observation. Um, but there was only one teen mom and didn't really get a lot, but there were two adult mom interactions. So I got I got a bit of that. Um, I sat there for about half an hour. And I noticed that I looked at more of the mom's behaviors than the children's behaviors and how they reacted and stuff like that, and what triggered mom's behaviors. Um, so I guess next time I can look at the kids' behaviors more so mm -hmm. than I did, and um, really hope that there are more teen moms there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for sharing the, um, I thought my first observation was a dud. Did anybody else feel that way? I can't see if there are hands around Bangor, but that's, that's a common experience too when you first start, thinking, oh, I'm not getting what I want to get. Don't throw it away, and don't discount it. Review that data every time you go over all of your data. Review that as well. Um, because especially as you get more and more information, you'll find more in your notes for that first uh, observation than what you can see right now uh, when you still only have a partial picture of what you're looking for. Um, so, common, again. So it's not really a dud, though. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you stay, so you don't have to be open-minded. So, I mean, if you go, like, you know, goes and they don't get what they want, you know, that's, you can't really attribute all four that a game does as well. You know? mm -hmm. so you, if you're open-minded about what you're trying to do, um, you can take that information and kind of tailor your question. Mm -hmm. You've got to kind of make the, you know, I don't know if they, they, they said that in the book earlier, um, kind of tailor your, your results to, to your question, or mm -hmm. was that something like that along those lines? I can't remember exactly what the wording was. Mm -hmm. But it's an iterative process at any rate. So each time you build on what you've already learned um, in order to learn more. So with yours particularly, when you're looking at the interactions between parents and kids, um, and then you're trying to compare the differences between teens versus adults, uh, you might have a very limited sample size. There's, there's a possibility that even after four observations, you only have you know, four or five examples of each. And so you have to really glean what you can from those, uh, those pieces of data that you get in order to determine what you can. I think that one of the, the big things that you uh, are going to want to strive to learn as much as you can through observation is the, the hows and the whys. So getting into the, the participant mindset rather than just the external observation. Um, and trying to figure out, okay, well, looking back over my previous observation, I saw that, you know, mom A did thus and such when her child did this. Okay, why would that have been a response? What other responses might there have been? Um, and then you can start trying to piece apart uh, how different behaviors interact with each other if you always have that why behind it. And you may not have an obvious answer. There might be 15 different possibilities, but it's also possible that you'll start see pa seeing patterns emerge. Um, and again, that's going to take multiple observations before you can really see those patterns clearly. But just always kind of keep that question in mind while you're looking at it. I feel like I got too much data or that I was missing things that were happening that I just couldn't, like I couldn't remember to record or I just, not that I didn't have the time. Um, and I found that very quickly that the question that I originally had is just not going to work. Mm. My original question was going to be just product 
placement affect what people buy mm -hmm. and we have these things what we call suggestive cells so they're right at like the right at each cash register and no one bought them. the only people that bought them it was because i had mentioned it so i couldn't uh -huh. include that um but i guess now what i'm going to do is just go back go to the same spots like on the same days around the same times to see I guess if I can find patterns there mm -hmm. or I don't know maybe I should try a different location in the store at the same time to see if I don't know yeah I can see why you're kind of lost too um but what I'm hearing and I might be uh misinterpreting this from my outsider perspective but you were an employee that day correct Yes. And so when you suggested products, they would get them, but they didn't just go and get them on their own in right. those suggested cell. That's data. So you have the absence of them buying them without the suggestion. So the product placement, at least in that one observation, didn't have an influence, uh, but the interpersonal interaction did. Um, and so that's something that you can consider. Is, is that part of is, is that part of a pattern within shopping? And that's not to say that there's definitely a conclusion here, but that's a piece of data that you have right there. Um, and then I think also, yeah, looking at different parts of the store to see if layout in different locations um, or different shopping behaviors, uh, and then also even just different times of day uh, if you see that same pattern happening or if different things are happening as well. Does anyone have any other thoughts? I would maybe start thinking about too, are they single shoppers or are they with other people? Are they talking about products with each other? or making individual decisions. Um, you could do, um, you know, product location versus um, like, uh, like product display. And I so if that influences it, so if there's something, like you know how they do like Coke or Pepsi things, or they do this huge elaborate <laughs> whatever, or like if the display its actual self, influences on what people buy, right? Hmm. I yeah. actually have been reporting that, like if the items were on sale, if it was like a decent sale, but again, I couldn't remember like to record that, plus what, like what else they bought, plus if they were female and how old they were, what their age range was, uh -huh. if, they, if they were with someone or not, and were they talking about anything. Uh huh. Are you able to record and it as it's happening? Probably not, no. So you're going uh, back after I the fact and writing down what you remember? Right. Okay. Like, I guess I could go back on our security tapes and look at it, um, but no, I don't, I don't think that people would appreciate me recording them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, if you just, like chose a gender and an age group and just focused on that. I mean, I mean, where you're so limited in what you can do in the moment. Mm -hmm. so, but like check marks, female do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you make a checkbox for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think you're also in a kind of a good situation that if you're at work and you are recognizably as an employee, you can carry a clipboard and make marks about stuff all you want and nobody is gonna think twice about that. Um, so, but then there's also the question, while you are doing research, are you able to stop work and actually put yourself in the mindset of research and observation in order to uh, gather all of this data at the time being? Um, so that might take, like you can uh, take your notes while you're working, you can compare it to the security footage if you have access to that, but also maybe even going in during um, off hours or taking a break for a half hour or something like that and doing observations rather than work for a bit, um, et cetera. Do any of these sound plausible to you? 
Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, because I'm at a restaurant, so there's a lot of stimulation. After 45 minutes, I was like exhausted. Yeah. And I know that I like wasn't focusing as well as I had been, and more people were coming, so it was harder. Mm -hmm. um, but so I drafted my notes in that three column format with the time, what I'm observing, like my impression. But now I almost want to go back and like tear it apart. And I don't know if this is the more quantitative part of me, but I want to be like, okay, so here's how many females there were. Here's where they were sitting at tables. Here's who used their cell phone. Here's, you know, like my overall impression of table number one and writing the paragraph about that. Mm -hmm. And then table number two, instead of having it be like fragmented like it is right now, where I'm kind of like, Looking at table one, looking at table three, table six, and mm -hmm. like I feel very, I feel very disorganized, but that could be because I think I'm more quantitative. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I gravitate towards. You can definitely mix your methods a bit. And particularly if you are taking, gathering all of this data, you can look for patterns and behavior compared to these different categories of quantitative data that you're gathering. Okay. Yeah. I do want you ultimately to be recording or reporting on the quality and the, the interactions and meanings and that sort of thing. But yeah, if you can find uh, some of that meaning by parsing out different categories of people or where they're sitting or things like that, definitely okay. use so it. I continue this format, but then I can restructure it mm -hmm. so that I can wrap my head around yes. it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, along those lines, did anyone find yourself mentally exhausted by the end of your observation setting? Yeah. I left. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that is a thing. It's hard work. Um, it really is. It's, it's very uh, brain intensive, uh, especially when you're putting yourself in that, that whole, like, all of your senses are aware, trying to soak up information and notice everything. That's not how we just regularly move throughout our lives. Uh, there's usually so much that we just filter out and, and ignore completely, and then trying to see all of those things that we ignore, it's I was, tiring. I was shocked at that alcohol consumption mm. that was happening. I was like, oh my God, he's like 70 years old. He's had like four drinks. Can he really drive? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it's in the notes. <laughs> like, periodically, like, wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> and uh, making note of your uh, mind, mind state, so while I'm getting really tired, so make a note of that because your notes might not be as clear or as precise, etc. But also making, making note of uh, thoughts and judgments that you have, like, holy crap, <laughs> that's a lot of alcohol he's drinking. <laughs> Now I'm worried about his safety if he's driving. Like, they might not go into your study, but sure, right. put it in your notes because it might be useful at some point. Who knows? At least to know that you were distracted thinking about that. Well, and who knows? Now it's, does alcohol consumption contribute to if you use your cell phone or not? Mm -hmm. Like, so, but I'm not going there yet. Okay. Just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shocking. Oh, I love research so much. <laughs> we have such wonderful thoughts go on in our heads when we're looking at life like this. Ah, it makes me so happy. Yesterday I was doing the second observation and as soon as we walked in there is a female mentally challenged. It's been housed there for over a year but she was refused at her concert, so she's not happy, so she wanted everyone to know. I was there for 45 minutes from the uh, moment I walked in until I left, she was still screaming. Oh, wow. So I said, at the end, I said, this is not going to be our long, so I'm leaving. Yeah. So I left. <laughs> yeah. And that's a part of the research, too. So yeah, I, I can't mm -hmm. really listen to what they're, they're doing now, you know, cooking process. Mm -hmm. There's another uh, tomato stand by the counter. It's close enough. It should be hurting, but the hair screw is so loud that I have to do this at the end as an mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, that's that's one of the things, what do they call it in Creswell, that the researcher is the tool or the instrument of the study. And yeah, when you get tired out or <laughs> overstimulated from a woman screaming for 45 minutes straight, yeah, how, <laughs> how good is your research going to be anyway? Take care of yourselves. Just please take care of yourselves, <laughs> physically, mentally, emotionally, all of that. found a couple of things aside from the age difference which was the big one that I talked about um, earlier but I found a couple of just other things that, that I that I expected to find not um, but like the, the attitude of the players depending on what they were doing like for, for instance when they when they were running and stretching in the beginning there was a lot of lollygagging and kind of complaining and the coach had to be like all right nobody walks everybody run but as soon as the soccer balls came out and it was time to kick them at the goal, like there was no more having to encourage people. They were running around like crazy, and you know, and you know, there was all kinds of enthusiasm then. Um, but even within that, um, if there was a ball in play that they would kick toward the goal, everybody would be right after it. But one would go wide of the goal and like a hundred feet into the parking lot, and there was nobody rushing to get that one. Uh -huh. You know, and so it, it kind of depended on what what they were doing um, and some of the one of the funny sounds that I actually noted here um, it was a quote from the quote uh, from the coach um, and this was toward the end when they were going to play a little game um, and I quote says I'm I'm going to put you where I want to put you regardless of where you want to go so this was the I, I gathered from that that they were complaining about who got to play defense and who got to play offense mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know that it was to a group of the younger players what didn't seem to be a problem with the older eighth grade, fourteen year old girls, mm -hmm. the younger ones. So I mean, those are just some of the things that I that I gathered through observation that I wouldn't have, you know, thought of one way or the other. I guess, but just some of the things that I came up on that I think I can build off of in my, you know, upcoming observations, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes down to the dynamic of the younger ones and the older ones. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I also like the, the observation about the, the difference in meaning in the different ways that they run or have to run. So it's the same action every time, right, running. But are they running uh, laps? Because that's boring. Are they running out into the parking lot to retrieve a ball? Because that's boring. Are they running during the game? Because that's fun. Um, and, and so the meaning behind it really changes that what the action actually is and what the motivation is. And that's also what we think about within psychology. Uh, I know this is a, a general social sciences class and we have like a lot of people from different fields. Uh, but in psychology, we often think about like the meaning of the space and the meaning of the activity to people. Uh, for example, the same physical space and location can be, you know, a playground or a school or a shopping mall or a war zone, just depending on what people are doing there and how they are ascribing meaning and what they're supposed to be uh, behaving there. And all of those places mean something different, even though it could be the same physical location. And so kind of trying to get into the meaning of the setting and the meaning of the interaction is... Uh, Oh, it's fun and exciting to me. I know I'm a big psychology nerd, but fantastic stuff. Uh, so even something as simple as running can have a lot of greatly different meaning when you just put it in even a slightly different context. Well, it's, I don't know why I kept liking it to this, but like uh, I kept thinking about when I was younger. And I would come in and tell my mother that I was hungry after school. And she's like, well, eat an apple. And all of a sudden, I'm not hungry anymore. Because I, she's like, well, if you're not hungry to eat an apple, if you're hungry enough to eat an apple, then you're just bored. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, I don't know why I related those two contexts to the running for a ball. That, no, I don't really want to run for that ball. Mm -hmm. But I'll run for the ball when it's time to have fun. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I was hungry. I'd be hungry for cake or Doritos, but I'm not hungry for apple <laughs> or broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know who you are. I want to hear from you. I think I got a little too off topic when I was doing my observation. I saw this, I think, I hope there were a couple. I started getting pretty in the middle of the park. And I kind of lost track of where I was going with it. I was more focused on it. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. So. Oh, that. Yeah. That's weird. I'm not going there Um. So, Aaron, uh, when I'm grading the transcripts later on, am I going to be reading some very descriptive okay. data from Just, you? <laughs> no, I. It was descriptive. I went out and changed it. Is it appropriate? I'm making trouble. <laughs> I have money with me. He started recording it and sending it to people because it was that bad. bad. Oh. I mean, they, they kept their, their clothes on, but no. So <laughs> somewhere else, more, more All right. So you got in, uh, a little a little sidetracked. Um, how did the rest yeah. of your data collection go? Uh, well, then it just got off topic towards the end of it because the lady took the dude's bike and laughed and okay, went downhill. <laughs> the next one will be better. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long were you out there observing? About an hour. Uh huh. Then they all went inside the homeless shelter. And I was talking to Jeremy, he thinks they probably were here and served dinner. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have a, a good sense of like what your question is or what you're trying to uh, yeah. figure out what you're observing? Yeah. yeah. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to look at how, how the, uh, the differences in ages uh, affect their, their actions toward each other. Like if I saw this one kid, he was probably about my age, he was dressed in decent clothes but he was walking in and out of the homeless shelter. So I was kind of confused. So I wanted to figure out like how many more of him there are and older people and how they act. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you're able to tell easily like who works there or volunteers yes. there versus who oh, is? Oh, yeah. I can tell who's, I mean, I have a pretty good idea. The ones that I'm kind of on the fence about, I don't really worry about them. There's quite a bit, uh -huh. probably about 15 to 20. Uh -huh. so. And are you only looking at uh, homeless people, or are you also looking at other people in that location and what they're doing? Well, it was mostly people that looked like they were homeless there. There's not many other people. Okay. It wasn't much traffic. Mm -hmm. And were people noticing you while you're watching them? No, that was my view. Okay. And I got a tin of windows. And I had my computer out, so. Okay. That's the parking lot right next to it. So you have a pretty anonymous location to observe from. Yeah. Uh, other than uh, the fun, sexy times, did you notice anything interesting about behaviors? They were always kind of chatting. Uh, the lady before she went over was with another group of people. So I don't know. I'm hoping that they were like in a relationship and not getting paid. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so this also raises, I guess, uh, at least potential for uh, ethical questions. What happens if you see a crime committed or something like that? What do you do? Well, so. right across uh, the street was Bangor Police Department. Yeah, so. but do you think Excuse. they're staring out the windows <laughs> watching for stuff? Or? Oh, well, no. no, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, like, would you want to call the police if you see something happening that is very obviously uh, a crime? Uh, um, you know, stuff like that. Someone gets stabbed? Yeah. Like if someone got stabbed, yeah, probably. Uh, selling drugs. Yeah, Nonviolent offenses like that. Yeah, so there's a lot of, like, questions that we kind of have to think through um, when we're observing in a natural setting because stuff happens, right? Um, and then, hmm. 
I'm also thinking about where you're observing. You can see their behaviors and like their uh, mannerisms, their body language. Are you able to hear actually what they're saying? Not really, no. Okay, so it's all, it's all just based on their movements, right? Yeah. And what are you gleaning so far from that? What's that? What are you gleaning from that so far? Have you uh, started coming up with any thoughts on the meanings behind their movements or their interactions? It just seemed like they were all friends. I, it didn't really seem like, I don't know. I, the second one's going to be able to narrow down things a little bit better. Okay. And you said with the second one, you're going to be looking at age differences. Is there anything else that's standing out to you to look at? Yeah. For? Just the different type of people that are, I don't know, like, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure this whole thing out. I don't have it set in stone yet. Okay. All right. Well, let me know if you want to talk through, <laughs> especially, I think this is kind of yeah. a difficult topic, or not a difficult topic. I think it's a difficult one because of uh, the anonymity of your observation and not being able to hear interactions, but then trying to figure out interpersonal <laughs> relationships and things like that from uh, behavioral interactions and, um, yeah, even with the, the couple, you can only say, I hope that they're together in a couple and not, you know, a business relationship, but you can't really know, right? Unless you go and ask, which I wouldn't suggest no, you do that. No. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if you want to talk through some of the details of, of uh, data gathering with this one, uh, we can definitely meet and do that. All right, I think Emily, are you the last one? So. Yeah, last um, but not least. I kind of had the same thing as Alexis. Like, I was getting frustrated because I was catching, like, bits and pieces of things because there were so many people. And then I would focus on one situation and I would hear something else and I'd be like, oh, man, I wish I knew what they were doing because that would have been really good. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe instead of focusing on, like, the whole area, I'll just pick more of a secluded spot where I can focus on the interactions there, but people are still coming and going, so there's still, like, a lot of population there, so mm -hmm. a little bit of everything, just not as much right. all at once. Mm -hmm. So you were having the kind of, ex the grass is always greener experience when there was too many options of what to observe, like everything you're observing, yeah. there's something more interesting happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, actually, I think that that's probably a good strategy going back for your next one is uh, changing your tack into something uh, a little more uh, spatially focused. So am I hearing you're not narrowing down your topic, just the location in which you're observing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that can that can really help you uh, glean more uh, rich data from a small piece rather than trying to gather whole large pieces of everything from everywhere. Yeah. Have you started finding like any story in your data? Um. Yeah. I think so. Um. I'm doing uh, like the relationship between. Uh, the RAs and the CNAs with the residents and people who push their call bells more frequently than others and I think that so far I've been able to tell who the residents are that push their call bells and who's more likely to deal with them rather than just kind of brush them off. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting. I think that's kind of where what I was hoping to find. Mm -hmm. Well good. And do you think the the idea of the space that you have uh, identified for your next observation, do you think you'll still be able to see a, an ongoing uh, pattern with that? Um, yeah, I think so. Last time I did like the dining hall, so it was everybody all at once because everyone has to come down for the meal. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm going to do the activity room for my next observation, so that way the people who like really get out there and they do stuff like in the retirement community and stuff they'll be down there which and some of the RAs will be there so I'll still be able to see the interaction between the people who are pushing their bells and the people who are answering. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well good. 
Uh, does anyone have any other thoughts or questions about your research that came up in discussions of everybody's research experience? All right, so I know some of you have already started your second observation, but uh, in two weeks is when I want to have uh, observations, for all four of your observations. Um, or more if you decide that you have to get uh, some more than four in order to have sufficient data. Just kind of use your own judgment for that. Um, but definitely at least four. Uh, and that's going to be in two weeks on October 5th. You'll have uploaded all of your transcripts and observation notes. Um, and each time you go through an observation, starting with this first time, I want you to go through that process of analyzing or let me rephrase that that process of reviewing your data each time. So tidy up your data, add any more notes, start looking for patterns, start looking for gaps, things that you didn't see or questions, why is this happening now versus other times, why is this happening at all, that sort of thing. So kind of go through that process of reviewing your data every time. Before you go to your second observation, look at observations one uh, before you go to your third observation, look at the notes from observations one and two. Before you go to your fourth <laughs> observations, look at the first three. Because every time you might see something new in the previous notes, but also it refreshes your mind uh, to kind of keep in mind what you had been seeing and what you can look for. Also, at some point, you're going to want to start looking at uh, disconfirming data. Right, So if you start having an idea of this is what is true in this setting, I want you to look for the opposite. I want you to look for cases in which that is not true or when that is not always true or not wholly true, if there are other things that are also true. Um, I want you to look at all of this and start thinking about not just the pattern that you see, but what might be exceptions to that pattern. Does that make sense? I'll take that as a yes. So uh, next week we are going to be reading uh, Creswell chapter four. And uh, chapter four is really starting to talk about all of these different five approaches and defining them and kind of how and why we use these different approaches that uh, Creswell's talking about in this book. Um, I would like you to think about which of these five approaches makes sense with your observation that you are doing. If it's multiple of the approaches that make sense um, and that seem to align with what you're doing, you can say multiple. But I want you to have an idea of what it is that you're looking at and what is the lens uh, that you're looking through or what are the lenses that you are looking through. Uh, so next week during the uh, class conversation, we're going to be talking about the five approaches. Uh, and so bring in any thoughts that you have about each of the different approaches, how they're used, why they're used, etc. cetera, uh, any questions that you have about them. Um, but also we're going to be reviewing what's going on with your research. So as you are conducting more observations, what new information are you finding? What new problems are arising? What new solutions have you discovered? Um, or do you need help discovering? Uh, what are gaps or questions that are coming up? What are the stories that you're starting to figure out? So we're going to check in with how things are going so that we can kind of keep up uh, with everybody's research. And um, yeah. I think the further we get in with our observations, the more we're going to be talking about patterns and what it is that we're finding. Any questions? All right, so in two weeks, we are going to be moving back to the Strauss and Corbin reading. That's for the October 5th. And I have received my hard copy of the uh, third edition. So I'm going to be comparing all of the editions and figuring out if indeed we want to be reading chapters five and six or if we're going to be reading other chapters, et cetera. So I'll let you know that next week. Um, I'll also put it online so that everybody is aware and has access to that information. And uh, that's all I got for today. So we, you are free. Have a good one.